I'm really excited to introduce uh, Lina Gonzalez Granados to you. I met her, I don't know, four or five years ago. Um, she was a, a student at Boston University, conducting student, and I knew right away that she was destined for great things. And what was really interesting to me was um, not only was she really an incredible musician and super dedicated and, and just um, really dedicated to the craft and, and the music, but she had a, a passion for outreach and for education and for starting things and entrepreneurialism. And she had an amazing ensemble that she started in Boston called the Unitas Ensemble. And just following her career since that in just a few very short years, you know, it's really taken off and I'm makes me so happy to see all of the great things that are happening, um, Lena, for you. And also the way that you're just an incredible advocate for composers and for other musicians and your colleagues and just a, a generous spirit and and full of um, full of energy and and generosity and so I knew that that was something that I wanted you to come in and talk with our fellows and our audience about and so it's great to have you here thank you for being here and making the time I know you're busy. Thank you, Peter. Actually, today is the perfect time to do this because I just arrived to my hometown in Colombia after a, a couple of very busy weeks. So I'm just resting and decompressing and reflecting on what's next. And well, what a better way to do it with in the company of you as a friend and the new friends that I'm going to meet here. And congratulations on New York Philharmonic. Amazing. Oh, thank you. Yes, that was a very unexpected surprise to have a debut uh, with the New York film, especially because the, it was the first time they were um, actually playing together complete without social distancing rules. And to do it in like in an outdoors space, we had like 3000 people every day. It was it's crazy, just crazy. So it feels like a dream, really. And if you if you don't know Lena's work, she's been um, making her debut and then many many returns to lots and lots of major orchestras, including Philadelphia and Seattle and um, now New York. And she's been um, all over the place um, and really been amazing to watch her career. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you, and and we we'd love to hear your uh your story your background and what you're doing and also all of the amazing advocacy and entrepreneurial work that you've been doing and and thinking about programming and all of these things we we have we only have an hour but i feel like i want to just pick your brain for hours and hours and hours so well thank you very much well i think everything that has happened up to this day uh, in my career was the direct direct result of having something to say and a voice. And that only happened because I have been very committed um, to, and this is very self-centered of me, but I'm very committed of like a continuous soul searching that I have been doing since I started this career. And um, a sense of which, which is my, like, who am I and how do I fit and how do I belong? Uh, because, um, it's been it's been very challenging in a lot of ways, um, so I always found my way into this career by only being myself, and that was reflected into my choices of programming since the very beginning. I am Colombian, and I salute you from my little room in my house in Cali today. I live in Boston, and I started here in in Colombia in Bogota, studying a piano and then conducting. And I remember having these conversations with my composer friends at the beginning of my career. I did this piece, it was a, I, I'll never forget it because I think that was what sparked my curiosity. My best friend wrote a piece for guitar orchestras and orchestra, like guitar orchestras and two guitars. And he asked me to conduct it, I was uh, 18. And I remember going to the concert and it's a, it was a acoustic spectralism, something very bizarre and out there, but I love the piece. And I believe that my uh, colleague composer friend like had something to say. And I remember starting going into the concert 
and people getting out of the concert and the, the being very upset. Why did I lend, lend myself into conducting a piece that was not uh, worth it? And for me, it was absolutely like bonkers to give a, a student piece a wor the same worth that another piece, I, I don't know, a classical of the canon had. And that, that was here in Colombia. And seeing all this rejection make, like fueled my life uh, uh, because I, I thought like as students, we had to support each other at the moment. And then when I graduated here in Colombia, I started seeing that the opportunities uh, for me were going to be very, very scarce um, or non-existent because we live in this extraordinary a male-dominated country and uh, I don't know, religiously charged uh, where women uh, have um, a strong relationship with, with leadership in general. So that's how I made the move to the United States. I studied there for a couple of years. Well, I studied there in Boston. First, I went to Juilliard one year and I met this amazing conductor. Her name was Alon or is Alondra de la Parra. She's Mexican and she had this um, orchestra called the um, Philharmonic Orchestra of the Americas. And I toured with them for a couple of uh, tours in Mexico and seeing the complete opposite thing from Colombia to Mexico. Like we went to this, like we would fill the stadiums of 10,000 people and people would yell. Um, I don't know, Huapango and that's on number two, like it was a Madonna concert and seeing, seeing people be claiming ownership of their own music, like Mexican music was beautiful to see. So that stayed for me for the longest time. And then I moved to Boston and started my uh, master's and um, I did my master's in wind ensemble conducting. That's how I started actually, uh, which is a... Um, a landscape that has a lot of contemporary music and it was a great start for me and but at NEC which is where I study I realized that a I was one of five Latinos when, when I was studying there and b nobody was programming that music I never saw it at school so the only person who would program a Latin American music or Latinx music was me or, you know, even, and I started seeing how people would react to, and this is 2012, so we're talking about almost 10 years ago. So how how this repertoire that was in, inherently mine wasn't being played and actually a little bit on the downplay, like, or, or under underestimated. So that's how I, again, that's what it fueled me to, to A, found Unitas Ensemble, which um, at the beginning, at the very core of the orchestra, its mission was or is to celebrate a Latinx artists. Uh, a, by commissioning the pieces, uh, by hiring Latinos of all, uh, all um, sides of the spectrum of music. We have, for example, um, a timpanist and a percussionist, but we have also a Latin percussionist. We have a Latin, a Venezuelan harpies plus a chromatic harpy, symphonic normal harpies, and making these combinations. And little by little, the ensemble has been growing. We recorded a I think that's when I met you when I was recording my first album with the Cuarteto Latinoamericano. And then when, when all this, of this was starting, like my movement, like in the micro level, especially because uh, it was the only thing that was happening in Boston uh, for Latinos and Latinos are a, a majority minority, you know, in the city. Um, it was the, the only space where you could see Latinos reflected into the music. It, it also meant that I um, hired Latinos or, um, that didn't have uh, the same opportunities in, um, in symphonic orchestras. And then all of this um, started uh, transferring to my work um, into the other orchestras that I started freelancing with, uh, the first thing being 
commissioning projects with, for example, Seattle, and then uh, wor uh, working with them as a fellow and in Philadelphia as a fellow, I was able to program music and advise over um, some of the repertoire. So I've seen how uh, having this niche that uh, uh, I don't want to claim expertise on, I don't know, 600 millions of uh, people's face, but at least having some sort of insight on how does this music belong to other has made me have in innings with other orchestras where I can uh, not only program uh, deliberately uh, Latin American music, but actually have some purpose and meaning into it outside tokenism. And uh, rewriting this story that is programming because at the end is just how do you write history and that it's being made at this moment how do you frame it how do you create those bridges instead of building a wall uh, on on this on, on this and how do you stay how do you stay true to your uh, political views and how can you permit this uh, with enough care that people really learn a little bit from you. So that's pretty much my story. It's not that long because I feel that this journey is beginning, but it has, I mean, I, since the beginning, I made a commitment uh, towards uh, having a repertoire, a personal repertoire that um, had some equitable um, benchmarks. Like I always have at least 50% of women composers throughout my season in the year. And throughout that we have, I have at this in my personal one, a, you know, a African Americans, Americans. And I try, and I, and it's a careful dance. It's not as easy to say like, oh, I'm going to commit this and this is how I'm going to do it, especially when it's not your shop, uh, when it's not your orchestra. But how to get in, into these um, conversations, the only way is to have it in your repertoire and just decided to go for it. Can you talk a little bit about what led you to start UNITAS um, and just kind of the beginning stages of it? You know, how did how did you get it off the ground? How did what was the what was the first thing you did? How did you build it? What were some of the things that were um, challenging or what is what were the some of the things that you were surprised by how easy it was when people found out about it or just those kind of things well the most difficult is being brave and go for it I, I think that's the most difficult is to say like okay th does it make sense to what I have um, the reason why I did it is because there was nothing like it where I lived, you know, in in the city that that I am, which is Boston, we had only one with what with our main orchestra, the Boston Symphony. We had over the ten years one piece played that was Latina, and then we had uh, the Boston Landmarks, um, which does some summer concerts, and sometimes they do the Latin American Fiesta, which is the the always the set, the three or four pieces, but Again, it's so much history behind it uh, that it, it doesn't even scratch the surface. So for me, that was the very first um, approach. Uh, that was one of the main reasons. The second was definitely because I, uh, I didn't envision a life where I couldn't see myself conducting uh, something that, that represented me in the voice that like uh, pieces that I liked and pieces that I thought were meaningful. So that's how I started it. It started with an idea uh, that I um, verbalized the idea to my the current CEO who turns out to be uh, my partner. And I said, you know, like we're about to graduate. What do you want to do? And I said, you know, I really want to be a music director of my own thing. I want to be able to call the shots every time. I want to. I want to know who do I hire. I want to know who do I want to work with because I still, when you're a student, <laughs> there is so much that you don't know about like life in the professional world. That it was a way for me to to give myself an opportunity to just learn from all the sides. You know, like uh, administrative, 
uh, leadership, uh, artistically, uh, all of these things that as a conductor you have to do and you don't necessarily uh, learn at school or you actually do not learn at school at all. Uh, you know, like they barely teach you how to rehearse, you know, and like if you, if you have a, trying to budget your time, trying to budget how much people do you need and how all of these things are so important to a, for a conductor. So, and definitely there was when, when I started, this is back in 2015. So I'm going to say pre former um, government. Uh, the visibility for Latinos and especially for women uh, in the conducting world were non-existent. Uh, you know, so the glass ceiling even it was even thicker for us. So uh, for me, it was a, a way to create my own experiences because I needed to be ready for the next opportunity. If I wasn't ready, who was going to hire me? Like people would overlook me even when I was a student. So this was an opportunity for me to just uh, make my, like create my story on my own terms. That's how I started. So I verbalized these. Uh, I got a couple of student grants actually from like entrepreneurial musicianship from NEC. It was like, I think maybe $5,000. And then I got a couple of backers in uh, crowdfunding and from the very beginning, I knew that I didn't want to do an ad hoc orchestra, but, but I paid every single person. And also it was an opportunity for people not to say no to me because it was repertoire that they didn't know at all. So how do you, <laughs> how do you entice musicians? Well, you pay them what is fair or at least what you can pay them and with the, with the promise. And actually I have honored my compromise like, all the time I've never not paid my orchestra never like it has all it has always been paid and with a lot of effort <laughs> so that's how we started and what we did was the first concert was destined to be classic so I found um three or four pieces that weren't the typical pieces that you hear in a uh, Latin American setting um for example, everybody does dance on number two. I didn't do dance on number two, but I did a dance on number three, which is also beautiful. But I, but I and I frame it in a destined to be classics um, because I do think those pieces belong into the canon. And the more people program them, uh, the more they move up to the ladder. And that's how I started my first concert. And then um, I have to say that I ha um, and I say this with all the humility in the world, um, that I have an eye to not be reactive but proactive in my in my programming. As I told you, it has always been the the programming has always been on the forefront of my uh, conducting endeavors, and oh, so this was before me too. I did I. I started looking for pieces about women composers and um, the disparity between women composers and women co and Latino women composers, and then even Afro-Latino women composers on the gender of the pay gap is uh, a, a direct reflection of the gender gap, the, the pay gender gap. Like in, in general, the pieces are underpaid, underplay. Uh, they have always been like, on the back so I decided to say like I have to do something about it like myself I'm just going to program for a season all women composers and this was even pre me too so people were like why is she doing this but at the same time it was a great opportunity for me to be ready when all of these uh, scandals happened and everybody was scrambling to just uh, program pieces because they need, needed to look good so for me, it has always been in that sense, very, very proactive. And then last year, pre-pandemic, actually, I won this, uh, um, this grant uh, in Boston uh, for a reimagined season. So I didn't have enough money to do like a full orchestra because uh, fundraising was tight a little bit before the pandemic, but I still did, I needed to do my concerts. Uh, so I actually did a reimagined season where I, scale down every piece 
you know, like try to re, uh, refurbish um, the pieces and just put it on a smaller settings and in, in alternative venues that we go. And when the pandemic happened, we didn't have to cancel anything because the pieces were already reduced. So we actually went ahead and we did a, the centenary of Piazzolla and it, when people were, were even ready. So in that sense, I have always like try to see, try to think every time I'm sitting with my, I have like a big a spreadsheet of the year, like every week, the, I don't know, the 40 weeks that I work, including the unit as one is like, okay, I need these, um, I did need, I need to do these pieces uh, for my development. And as a freelancer conductor, these pieces will help me to get into the next stage. How do you, I balance this and then I start, okay, I go to X place. How is this a uh, city? Um, what population do they have? What does this population need from me that I can give them? Some of the some of the orchestras they definitely are not interested into programming this music. Um, I can give you an example. Sometimes in Europe they either go full token. It's like, let's do the Latin American fiesta or they are like, no, we want to see only romantic Ger German, Austrian repertoire of the romanticism. And this is what you are uh, hired to do. And that's completely fine, you know, but I don't go out without giving a fight. I think that's or like having a conversation that it's thoughtful, like, okay, how do, how can we make this, um, an experience that also is going to fulfill me in general. Yeah, and, and I think that I, that's always kind of struck me about you is is the, the few things, you know, about, about the integrity, you know, about paying people from the very beginning. That was a, you know, a, a priority for you and, and also programming proactively and not reactively. And I think that that you know, like you said, everybody now is scrambling to be to make up for lost time or to look good by doing the pieces that they really should be doing, you know, but what I what I love about you and your career is that, you know, you've been doing these pieces for years, you know, yeah. I mean, it's not it's not like, oh, okay, we need to get somebody, let's get somebody who just is like tokenism. No, it's like this is this is your life project, you know, and you can come into those situations and sure they they feel like they need to kind of check the boxes or whatever, but you're coming in there with, you know, artistic integrity. Um, this is what you do. This is who you are. So you're perfectly positioned for that. And that, that Ex yeah, exactly. And the thing is that, um, and I don't, I don't say it for all the, I, I don't think everybody that it's a minority should do this. It, it is a personal decision to commit to a repertoire that you feel a, it speaks a, it speaks your language, you know, for me, or like not ever, like, for example, I became an American citizen in February and thank you. And for me, it was very important that now, like, and be, because I have been living in the States for 10 years, like I have, for relationship with beautiful, beautiful American composers that might not fit that one part of my dimension of my identity, which is Latino, other, you know? But, and so how do I embrace them? You know, like, how do I embrace them? How, how do, how are our philosophies aligned? I think it's about alignment, like always creating the bond and creating this bridge between between composer and conductor or, or composer and performer. Um, so how do I do it? For example, when I go to Europe uh, or to South America, I always bring American music, at least one of the pieces, because that's also part of my identity. Now I don't do only Latin American music in Europe. I do, okay, uh, I, always, I also do American music that might be uh, with different identities. Uh, otherwise, it becomes performative allyship. You know, it's like, oh, we all, all we need to do this piece by this composer because uh, we need to fill the box. And I think that that will wear off very, very, very fast. 
I want to leave plenty of, of space for for questions, you know, um, but I, I think it's so. So please chime in, everybody, um, when you have them. But I think it's really interesting, you know, in your in your work as a conductor, what you said about starting Unitas, right, is as a music director, you make all of the decisions and you do all the hiring and you plan the season and you have especially with an ensemble that you start yourself, you have full control mm -hmm. over it, right? But now you're making most of your living now as a guest conductor, right? As a freelance conductor. So, yes. but I think you have a really interesting um, view into these large institutions and how mm -hmm. they're thinking, you know, because, because in the last year, of course, everybody wants to, you know, look good, right? And they want to do the right thing. And, and, there's a whole spectrum of things happening, right? But, but you're in the room, you're part of these conversations. And, you, and um, I just wonder, you know, what are you what are you hearing? And what are you seeing? And in, in these large institutions that move so slowly, um, but are trying to do the right, the right thing. thing, you know, what, what, just talk to us a little bit about those conversations that you're having. Um, that is a very interesting question. Um, for example, I'm just gonna name two names because are the two organizations that ha I have belonged the longest. Uh, with Seattle, um, it has always been in the fabric of their programming before even these. Um, the compromise that they have with forging these relationships of composers that are not the canon and the canon. So this has not been a, and, and the audience have been used to it. They, they have always been so advanced in the way that they communicate themselves. Even for example, in the micro, like in the, in the administrative side, you see, for example, uh, the pronouns that they, uh, that they identify for lo the longest time, you know, uh, that they acknowledge that they live in indigenous land. This is all, they, this is already like part of their their fabric as a as an organization for the longest time, so they they really and they had an amazing when I when I entered the organization they really had an amazing uh, VP of artistic uh, advisor um, who's now the artistic director of London Symphony if I'm not mistaken, uh, which is I uh, know uh, London Philharmonic which is Elena uh, Dubinets who's an extraordinary uh, musicologist. So this has been new. Um, in the side of Philly, they have been doing amazing work way before uh, all these things of BLM. Uh, they, I was part of these conversations um, that help place in order of uh, uh, diversity and inclusion. And it has, a, you know, how artistic planning works like years, years in advance. So this was already happening, but people still don't see it until it happens. Now, I sometimes like for them, like, and this is like, this is not, um, how do I say it? This is not because I belong to these organizations, but I, I have always been amazed how the, when the when the organization is this big, at least in in my case, the conversation has always been um, very fascinating because I have a voice into the input. Even as an assistant conductor, as a conducting fellow, I was able to commission a piece or I was able to program pieces. That that because I had a vision on it, and they were asking me on it. It's not that oh you're Latino, you you must know these pieces. No. It was like, how does this fit with everything that we're doing already? Uh, I have been approached by different orchestras that they want to work with me, but they don't really, they don't really listen to what I have to say. So it's like, I want to program you because you're Latina. Can you do a Latin uh, piece? And then when I, we start talking about these uh, things, they are really not interested. In the conversation and then they want to end up with the same two or three pieces and those conversations i really am not interested in especially when it's a halloween concert dia de los muertos like all of these 
that they come and go sometimes. Um, so I just like, I really think that from the very beginning, I was like, I did one concert because I didn't know any better. I did one concert that was under one rehearsal, extremely difficult music because uh, I mean, new music is need, needs time to breathe and to grow into the orchestra. It doesn't matter where it comes from. You know, it, Peter, you're an expert in this music and that music deserves the time to make it sound good. And, but when that doesn't happen, I, I, I really, from the beginning, I, I was telling the person who helps me, my manager is like, I am definitely not interested in engaging in these conversations, please don't put it into the table. Uh, I prefer not to have a job. Uh, and that has always been, I mean, I talk with the privilege of not needing a job, but being able to work a lot uh, into it um, the way that I want to. Uh, so yes, that's, that, that's how it is. There are orchestras that, yes, you know, some of them are interested, some of them, and it does come from, there's a different, I think the, the problem of those conversations is that uh, they don't necessarily come from, the interest doesn't necessarily come from one person, but you do have, you really need to have a, uh, a music director that embraces diversity in every way, shape or form. You need an artistic uh, advisor that knows a lot of about repertoire. And definitely you need um, an administration that, that wants to embrace this. So there's a lot of uh, pieces moving um, into, and it's like what I said before, it's a careful dance. You know, like you negotiate, for, for example, for me, my negotiation tactic is that I always start with the most ambitious piece. For example, one of the pieces that I adore and I premiere, uh, it was premiered in Detroit by Michelle Merrill, but I did the South American premiere is Gabriela Frank's Concerto for Orchestra. She's one of my dearest friends and not, not only that i have explored for a couple of years her input you know like all her pieces she'll so be here, the, she'll be here next week i'm really oh, excited I, about that i love her so excited. Cool people yeah. yeah she she's she's like my sister in these into these issues um and i learn a lot from her because she has also this sort of an integrity but her concerto for orchestra is very difficult uh, and uh, it's one of those pieces that I just always say, like, if you want to do a Latin American piece, I'm not going to do the five minute piece. I'm going to do the 30 minute piece that deserve the time to just put it there. And I always start with that one. And then, or I start with the biggest piece. I don't know, the what, I don't know, like whatever piece it is. And then if they're like, no, we need to start going down. So then I, I have been, okay, I can change this one for this one. I can change this one. And then if it's, uh, if, the, if the expectations from the other side are too low or like I, I don't get to meet like the, uh, this with, with my taste, I'm like, maybe this is not the gig for me. So I do, it's a negotiation. I always, and you know, I could do the, the, the other pieces and program the, them like from, from the beginning. But I always go higher because that's exactly how I what I learned about unit is that when you pitch uh, a, your speech, your elevator speech about who you are and why did you form this orchestra to anyone, you always want to like to someone who gives you money, you want to tell them that like if you ask for money, oh, you want to ask them for the most amount of money that you can that they can give you. You know, and then it goes down. If you ask them to give you, I don't know, one dollar, they will give you one dollar. So that's how I think about my li my life. It sounds a little capitalistic, but so that's how I I I think of programming. I I just go for the highest one, and then I start going down into my list. That's great. You know, there's there's a, a cellist now um, who's. Rocio, who's here, and it's her second year with the festival, and she's got a really interesting project working on, um, and a commissioning project, and I thought it might be interesting for her to to meet you and, and tell you a little bit about the project, and, you know, maybe you have some suggestions. 
Hi, Very Rocio. nice to meet you. Hi. Um, nice to meet you, Lisa. Thank you, Peter, for introducing. Um, first of all, uh, I have to say that when you were telling your story, it resonates so much with you. Um, Dan Son, Five, Wapango, those are pieces that I have memorized because I have planned at least more than 10 times. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, and sending you a big hug to you, to you and your family. I hope everyone is safe in Colombia um, under Thank the current you. circumstances. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate it a lot. Yes, um, I'm the project that Peter is talking about is I'm commissioning, part of it is I'm commissioning a piece with Anne LeBaron. She is a commission that is donation-based for Cello Solo. The piece is called Feminicid and it talks about um, the feminicides that are, has been happening in North America, in mm -hmm. Canada with the Highway of Tears. Um, wow. The Highway 69 um, in the States with the police brutality towards Black women in, and Mexico, Ciudad Juarez, which is, uh, which is, oh, it's, it's so heartbreaking. heartbreaking. Um, um, you, uh, I know, you know, in uh, Latin America, there's a lot of feminists and injustice towards women in Mexico. Just last year, um, every day there were ten women killed every day. So, um, and part of the project is also I'm seen often since um, quarantine happened. Um, it happened like I don't know if you have heard of Red the Compositoras Latino Americanas that started mm -hmm. Tania Rubia. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, got, um, I joined them uh, probably just by luck from the beginning. Um, and I have been contacting with Macri Cáceres, Ana, Ana Mora, who's a um, composer also from Colombia. And um, through the Red, I have been able to get music from um, different Latin, female Latin American composers. I know that you said, I, 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 I agree completely when you said that um, choosing to do a career or base your line of music in Latin American or the music that you feel that you relate to. And this is something that I really passion, passionate about. I, I like, I mean, I, I Bach is always there. And as I feel a little bit like I have been playing Bach as I have been playing the Alde Danzones. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, I was wondering if you have any advice regarding like uh, um, how to like manage this program um, of preparator or um, how could I um, improve the like places to perform it without being too much like, oh yeah, um, Latino and but given like the proper importance that it has. I don't know if I follow your question, but let me, let me see if I answer it correctly. Uh, so you want this program to not feel like it's a tokenism because it's Latino and because it comes from a Latina. I, actually think that being Latina is a treasure and uh, that I embrace uh, my identity um, fully um, without apology. I don't care if people think I'm too Latina to do a concert. Uh, that's how I see it at least. Um, it's beautiful that you are intersecting uh, the feminicide, which is a, a global um, problem, and you are focusing it in the Americas, you know, so it's Canada, the States, and Mexico, it's amazing. So one way is to say that this is uh, global, but it's like it affects you 
affects the Americas and people people embrace these as a, a, a bigger thing. I don't know how you handle it, but the another way that I do is trying to look for pieces that balance such a horrific thing out a little bit. This is for audiences. And I'm not saying that you are going to dump down your program because no, like this is something that it's important to you. Uh, so I'm gonna give you an example of something that I did with Unitas and you maybe can think about it. So for me, uh, I have always, um, like, as you said, the situation in Colombia is absolutely terrific, uh, horrific. And at this moment with the strikes is just terrible. But something that I lived uh, throughout my life is that, I mean, I'm 35 years old and this armed conflict with the guerrillas has been there for 60 years. So I've never lived in Colombia where there was no war. You know, it's something that it's absolutely terrible. So I decided to, to commission a piece that um, was, it's called Lamentos Cruzados, so uh, crossed laments. And this piece, um, so I said, okay, I don't have, um, how, how, do I, how do I ambition I want to talk about this piece? So I thought about one piece that it's uh, very common, uh, which is Stuart du Soldat. So Stuart du Soldat uh, was having their uh, anniversary um, a couple of years ago, the 100th anniversary of the Stuart du Soldat. It was born in this war. It's a canonic piece. It's a piece that everybody knows, at least in Boston. And what I did is that I gather with my friend, the composer, uh, letters from different, uh, from different uh, sites of the armed conflict. So a father who lost uh, his son in the last massacre that has happened here in Colombia. I got a letter from a police person and I got a letter from actually a well, it's not that I got it personally, but I there was a guerrilla, a, like a, a, an, a, a guerrilla person, a rebel, who wrote a letter and put it on the newspaper. And we use all these letters and we created our own a homage to the Stuart du Soldat that was Latina. You know, so it was a way to create a bridge with something that, I mean, the, the story of, of, of the Stuart is about Faust and about like selling your, you know, the your life to the devil, but you can actually talk about this, giving the, it context for something that people can understand and people can relate. And then uh, your act activism becomes also uh, ingrained and in depth with other pieces of music. So that's that for me would be a way for you to do it. I don't know if it's better or if it's worse, but um, people come to, to artistic endeavors to be challenged and to be uplifted too. So this is something that you are you really feel um, like speaking. So celebrate it. I mean, celebrate the fact that you are a Latina and 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 that you're coming from this side because you know how it is. You know, you you hear that uh, how many people are dying in Mexico and those deaths are painful to you. Like you feel it, like let people into you, into your pain, like let like let people relate to your cause so they can follow that. I don't know if that answers the question, but I hope it works and I wish you like the best in your endeavors and please keep me updated. Thank you, yes, it answered. Cool. Does anybody else have another question? Where is my friend Peter asking? Eva has a question. Hi. Um, so I'm um, a Latin American cellist as well. And I have always felt a little disconnected from the Latin American community, mostly because, as you said, um, it's hard to come by. Latin American or uh, musicians sometimes and mm -hmm. institutions like I went to NEC as well. There weren't many people to connect with, and um, Rocio has actually given me some that um, 
she told me about that group um, that she mentioned earlier. Um, but I was wondering if you have any recommendations or resources on how to connect more with other Latin Americans and you know create music together. I mean, there are several of us here, so that's wonderful um, to make those connections here. But um, yeah, I was wondering what you know about. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually, for cellists, there is actually a beautiful resource that it's called the Latinx Cello Catalog, I think. And it's, um, it's a, it was a sponsored by a Sphinx. There is this uh, teacher called Horacio, who's Venezuelan, and I think he teaches at Wisconsin, Dr. Horacio or something. <laughs> Sorry, no, remember the last name, but it's a, a Sphinx did it. It's like the Sphinx Cello Catalog. And they have a lot of Latin American uh, pieces there that you, and also the way um, they teach you, they, they tell you where and how to get in touch uh, with them. I think what I, what I did to create those meaningful communications, I started with composers and just wrote them. It's like, hey, I, I really want to hear your music. Do you have like a place to, and then these conversations happen organically. Um, but if you have Latin American, uh, the, the way to, to do it is like try to find Latin American friends and uh, ask them if they know some of the music and some of the popular music too, you know. That's where I think uh, there is a lot of uh, inspiration into this music that you will find and, and just listen to them and create those meaningful things. I think as, as Sphinx has a great, great resources of connecting with people like you don't have to uh, to be only a, a white I, I hate the, the way that it sounds but you don't have to be you know only a white identifying American just to be able to go to a sphinx a, a conference or to a, or even the League of Latin America, of American orchestras and just make friends there those networking um, situations where you can be, an ally and listen to people getting their struggles, I think will will help you find the voice within the repertoire. I think you don't, and the, what you bring is so beautiful because you said that you want to learn. Like you don't have to be, uh, like you don't have to identify to, to uh, or have this part of your identity to be able to make art. And I think that's the ultimate goal that you don't have to be one way or the other to program this music. So I, I hope you can do it. If you, like, if you don't find it, tell Peter to send my email and I, can, and I can guide you. If I find pieces, I'll just send it to you. Great. <laughs> very, very nice to meet you. So thank you. Where are you, Peter? I'm right here. Yeah. It looks like it looks like Aurora has a question. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. And um, I actually believe that we've spoken in the past. I think it was on Clubhouse a couple of weeks ago or at some point. Oh, that's so cool. Now I can see your face. Yeah. I, yes, it's so great to see you. Yeah, see your face as well. Um, I am a, a great admirer of your work, everything you, you do in terms of like representation and, and everything you're doing with your Unitas Ensemble and, and demanding like to play the gems in the repertoire that maybe uh, a lot of audiences around the world don't particularly know. Um, my question to you is, do you, Considering the rise of independent ensembles and independent um, orchestras and musical initiatives around the globe, specifically during you know the rise of this global pandemic, do you do you believe that gatekeeping from like major institutions, major orchestras are still going to be a thing in the next couple of years? And uh, if if yes or if no. Do you believe that these new independent organizations are going to pave the way for new um, performance opportunities for new performance venues and and what role do you think uh, perhaps the next generation of musicians are going to play in that? Well, I um, 
It's very interesting, your question. Let me see how can I answer this uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, so I hope there is no gatekeeping, but I'm sure there is going to be. And it's going, and it's a, it's motivated by fundraising and the amount of money, you know, that you can, you can get at least, like people are fighting for money to get these grants uh, or to get initiatives. Even the big orchestras are scrambling for money. So I think, I, I think people, people will fight for the money. But now the opportunity, I, I think now with the, the real, how do I say, acknowledgement and um, you, accountability that has um, a rise. And like pe people are not afraid of calling people out. I think that's going to help a lot uh, to, um, for a small organizations to do the right thing. And I think um, the people that will survive into this pandemic, uh, and this is me pontificating because I mean, I don't have like the answers, but I wish that the people that survive in this pandemic is the people that care about people and not about brands. And that you go and you sit into the libraries and you talk to a child and you go and do a, a, a recital, you know, on a neighborhood that really, really needs the money you know, like really needs the education, that's where it's gonna be the difference. Like if we can, if we can have these organizations and I mean, you you won't become rich into doing this, you know, uh, but if you have integrity enough to make the difference for one person in the room that is not your normal concert goer, that is success for me. And uh, that is only, that that can only be done with the grassroots organizations, you know, and with people that, that really care about making a change. The future and, is local, isn't it? Excuse me? The future is local, isn't it? I I, I, I think so. I, th I, I think so. The, the future is global and the people who who go to concerts uh, are, are, are paying attention, are really paying attention. It does, um, I mean, I, I, I saw it a couple um, this weekend when I went to, to conduct the New York field. I mean, yes, awesome to do a, a New York field debut, in, you know, but what it was amazing was to see people sitting on the grounds again, and just trying to yearn for the music, even if it was like honking and ambulances and nobody in the orchestra knew what was happening. And I was just waving my arms like a stupid person. Like it, it wasn't together, it didn't matter. It was like people being healed by music in real time. It's not about the brand or the likes or the streamings or I mean, how many, how many streamings have you seen in the last month? I, I haven't, I hate the streamings again. You know, like I cannot be in computers anymore. I just are like I came back to to a, a a Zoom meeting just because theater is such an amazing person and because you 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 are worth it. But it's absolutely local for me, yeah. And I think also that's why orchestras were struggling because nobody cared about all, like the people who were seeing really the concerts. You know, like they, they, they wanted to like, oh, how many likes or how many things, or uh, is this an orchestra that is touring? Okay, touring, le touring was banished, so what is next? And then you start seeing that the concerts that matter were the ones that you did in the little neighborhood. Uh, the concerts that were, those things were the ones that kept the orchestra alive. And the, the smaller institutions are the ones that have been really leading the way, you know, as, I mean, just, as you said, um, you know, big orchestras plan years out and they're, they're a big, they're a big ship. They don't, they don't turn quickly and everything, you know, even to do anything small, there, there's so much money involved, you know, so that the, the, the small orchestras and the small organizations and the new organizations it seems to me in the pandemic, the playing field was leveled and they were the ones who leading the way and making a difference. So I think that that's yeah. really inspiring. 
Yes, and for example, I'm gonna, of course, Gabby is going to talk about, about, about her academy, but I want to give you a little bit of example of how some things permeated. So Gabby has this uh, amazing academy of creative music that she uh, fosters, com fosters and mentors uh, composers. And one of her um, goals before the pandemic was actually, she took three composers and uh, that are very young, uh, young and very up and coming and about their careers about to explode. Uh, one is Canadian Iranian, one is a woman that teaches at Peabody and the other is um, Carlos Simon who has his uh, career has been blooming. And they, uh, he commissioned these pieces um, in response of the symphonies uh, of the Beethoven symphonies for the Philadelphia Orchestra. And all of these five pieces now uh, with the pandemic uh, and these composers have exploded out because the, the, the thought was born not out of a reaction. Like they were able to adapt. So these pieces, for example, Carlos did this piece called Fate Now Comfort that have been played by every single major orchestra now uh, in the rise of uh, the Black Lives Matter. And it's beyond amazing to see how something that is so small uh, or that started as an idea like Gabby's just got out in major ways. So for, for me, like your eff if your effort is good enough on the on the micro level, it will show to a big thing. That's amazing and something to really keep in mind. And just that's really like I again what I what I feel about you is that on the micro level the integrity is there, you know, and they say the way that you do anything is the way you do everything. Right. Mm -hmm. So that All really right. makes sense. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And thank you for joining us and for being on a computer. I know that's not what you want to be doing, especially you can be with your family, um, but it means so much to us and, and, and uh, we're so grateful. So No, Peter, you. for me, it's so, so important that you do this and you have been such a, you have like, you weren't my teacher, but you have been such an inspiration that for me, it's like, you're the, one of the nicest person on the business. I could not have said no to you. Oh, well, Ever. you're, you're my teacher. You're my teacher. Yeah. So <laughs> I admire you um, so much. So let's, let's talk soon offline. And, and I'm so grateful for this and um, be safe. Enjoy your family and we'll talk soon. Okay. Okay. Thank is this so over much. now? This I'm is so over. Sad. Yeah. Oh my God. This is yeah. very sad. Well, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, thank you for being here uh, today. And I wish you all the best. Um, not there is nothing small in what everybody does. And, and there is something that I I didn't say, but ever since I studied at school, I'm sorry. I'm just getting now that I got inspired. I'm just gonna say, <laughs> it. every time I started school, even it was the recital of the little babies doing the like the the very thing. I well, I have always been super hyperbolic. For me, every single thing is the best, biggest thing that I have ever done. So I never waited to, to think that I needed to do a big debut to make my art important. And that's how you claim your space in the world. I think that is very important. Nothing, nothing is small enough when you make art because you're changing the lives of someone if you do it correctly. So I hope that I, I want to leave you with that thought that please celebrate yourself, claim your space. You, it doesn't matter who you are or what do you do. Your space is there, you belong there. Thank you so much. So thank inspiring. You. Oh, thank you. Well, I'll leave you now so you can have your other uh, things, but thank you so much for having me. Take care.